Okay, Dave, please go ahead. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank Arjan for the, the invitation to, uh, to give this talk. So yeah, maybe I should dissect the, the record long title uh, a bit. So first of all, the talk is about one body reduced density matrix functional theory, which I think many of you will have uh, heard of. Um, second part is that it will be specifically uh, about one RDMFT at, at finite temperature in the canonical ensemble. And uh, I will be talking about uh, non-interacting uh, reference systems. And um, yeah, this has something to do with the bosonic and fermionic silicon algorithms, but that I will explain later. So the uh, contents of this talk are mostly in a manuscript, which is on, on the archive and is currently on the review. Uh, all the code used in the uh, manuscript uh, can be found in my uh, GitHub. And what is also, uh, I think, important to note is that uh, one of my, uh, or two of my colleagues, uh, uh, Serena Suter and uh, Klaus Kiesbert, they, I think last week, uh, put a manuscript on the archive, which uh, really puts uh, one RDMFT in the canonical ensemble on a proper uh, theoretical foundation. So first, a very, very brief uh, introduction of DFT and one RDMFT. So our, the core issue we keep getting stuck into in many body theory is the curse of dimensionality, the exponential growth of the Hilbert space with the number of particles. So reduced uh, density functional theories or density matrix functional theory source, such as DFT and uh, one RDMFT provide a potential way out by uh, getting rid of this curse of dimensionality. However, this comes at the price of having to uh, approximate functionals, and that's, of course, uh, where uh, the big problem is. So 1RD MFT is especially interesting for uh, strongly correlated systems where it has potential to outperform DFT. So then uh, the finite temperature part. So um, typical applications of DFT and 1RD MFT have been at zero temperature. That's where it's, uh, it's mostly used. Um, but there exists, um, of course, formalisms. Uh, to doing uh, DFT and 1RD MFT at finite temperature. So finite temperature 1RD MFT is especially interesting. Um, the reason for that is actually in, in a way, so, so 1RD MFT at zero temperature already has to deal with uh, fractional occupations, uh, unlike uh, Koncham DFT. Uh, so uh, adding the finite temperature isn't uh, that bad for us. So previous work uh, at finite temperature 1RD MFT uh, has been uh, in the ground canonical ensemble. So. Uh, work of, of uh, Tim Baltzi, as well as uh, yeah, giving up a, a correct uh, theoretical background uh, by uh, Klaas Giesbert and uh, uh, Michael Rugenthaler. Now, the canonical ensemble uh, is more complicated, right? So, so often in, in uh, physics, um, we prefer the grand canonical uh, case for, for bosons or fermions uh, because we, we get nice expressions which are not there in the canonical ensemble. And we can kind of motivate uh, always choosing the ground canonical by the fact that in the thermodynamic limit, the choice of ensemble is irrelevant. However, if, if we are at low temperatures and we have a finite systems, so we are far from this the thermodynamic limit, uh, then non-negligible uh, effects can uh, appear. So when we use a, a non-interacting reference system, uh, there is an additional uh, po potential uh, advantage, namely that if our interacting system is uh, canonical, then a canonical reference system may be closer in a particular sense than the ground canonical reference. So um, yeah, just very briefly about applications of the finite temperature. So uh, one dense matter is one I find uh, quite interesting. So uh, temperatures at which uh, both quantum effects and finite temperature effects are, are important, uh, ultra cold atoms. And yeah, so, so I'm, I'm uh, a chemist, so you probably know better than I do. Um, at zero temperature, which is uh, what I've previously been mostly working on, for example, for electrons, uh, we can use non-interacting ensemble functionals from, from finite temperature as kind of a base functional and then correct. Furthermore, also in some recent work of Wang and Barents, um, they, what they have shown is that you can actually use entropy uh, to also model correlation energies in 1RD MFT. And I have reason to believe that uh, this will work better actually within the canonical ensemble. So what will I discuss in this talk? So uh, first of all, I want to point out so this, this theoretical foundation of canonical 1RD MFT has been uh, laid by uh, Suter and Gisbert. In particular, uh, what they showed is unique free representability. So for every um, correct uh, 1RDM, uh, there exists a unique corresponding uh, one particle potential. Then this talk kind of goes beyond that, uh, even though the manuscript was 
published before, uh, kind of hoping that indeed uh, the, it, the foundation was sound. Um, so I'm, I'm taking some several steps in establishing a practical canonical 1RDMFT by introducing a non-interacting uh, reference system. So the focus of the talk is then also uh, more on the methodology, establishing the theory required algorithms and uh, their implementation in Python with uh, JAX. So the, the resulting code, which I called uh, the BF Syncorn package is open source, and you can then generate all the figures in this talk uh, with the supplied notebooks if you want. Uh, finally, I will just uh, discuss a very preliminary results of an investigation of uh, electrons at zero temperature. So just for uh, zero temperature uh, in this talk, we'll only discuss uh, equilibrium um, situations, uh, only two body interactions. Uh, that's not required, of course, but it's, it's just kind of the start. And what we uh, then want to do is we want to find the lowest eigenvalue or eigenfactor of our Hamiltonian H. So in our Hamiltonian H, we have uh, a one particle part denoted by the, the small H, which corresponds to uh, kinetic energy, external potential, and a two body part corresponding to the particle particle interaction. Now here with this uh, PQ double bar RS, I denote either the symmetrized or anti-symmetrized uh, integrals of the particle particle interaction. And with the plus, uh, I will always refer to bosons and with the minus always to fermions. So what is kind of important here is, uh, that I've been using these colors green for bosons and, and red for the, the bad fermions. So we find our ground state energy. Now we want to minimize over all wave functions um, the, the energy expression we get from taking the expectation value of our um, Hamiltonian. And what we then see is that uh, we need these expectation values of uh, this one particle operator and this two particle operator. So this uh, leads us to introducing reduced density matrices. We want to simplify our energy expression using uh, the one RDM and the two RDM. So the one RDM, this uh, little gamma, um, we obtain it from uh, the full n particle density matrix by tracing it with this one particle operator. Um, in the case of the two RDM, we have this uh, full uh, two particle operator. Then we can rewrite. So, so first of all, we switch to uh, density matrices because uh, it's, it's more convenient of dealing with n particle density matrices than, than pure states um, when we are dealing with 1RDMFT. And we then uh, only need these 1RDMs uh, and 2RDMs of this uh, density matrix. So our goal now is to use RDMs instead of the full n body density matrix. There is, however, a slight caveat, of course. So we cannot just uh, switch our minimization around from one to the other. We have the so-called uh, n-representability conditions. So we must always ensure that there exists either a bosonic or fermionic, depending on the problem, density matrix, such that we get the correct one-body or two-body reduced density matrix. Now, for the two RDM, it's 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 quite known that this problem is is completely intractable. Uh, so we resort instead to the one-body reduced density matrix, where uh, Coleman, in a very nice proof, I think, showed that if our uh, one-body reduced density matrix uh, traces to the correct amount of electrons or end uh, is positive semi-definite. Uh, then for bosons, we um, know that there exists uh, a density matrix. And for fermions, we need the additional constraint that one minus the one body reduced density matrix needs to be uh, positive semi-definite as well. Then uh, when we are treating fluctuating particle numbers, so, so a ground canonical ensemble, we simply drop this trace requirement. In um, in, in practice, um, almost all functionals are written in terms of uh, not the 1RDM itself, but uh, in terms of its eigen decomposition. So the eigenvalues, which are the natural orbital occupation numbers, which uh, I have denoted with the small NP, and the natural orbitals, uh, which are these phi P, which are then expanded in uh, a particular basis where you are the expansion coefficients. In, uh, in, in terms of these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, we can write these, these n-representability conditions as that the uh, natural orbital occupation numbers need to sum to n. The, they need to be uh, positive semi-definite. Uh, the orbitals need to be uh, orthonormal. And we also need that uh, for fermions that they are below one, which is our uh, Pauli condition, essentially. Now, the problem, of course, with 1RDM uh, instead of 2RDM is that uh, we, we 
need a particular uh, two-body interaction functional uh, w of gamma which is unknown so if we want to move towards approximations it makes sense to model the two-body reduced density matrix in terms of the one on the n gamma so we write now this uh, two RDM as a function of the one RDM, and we contract it with the uh, two electron integrals, uh, two particle integrals. I'm going to say electron or what I think. Um, and one particular way of decomposing this two body reduced density matrix, which I think is generally quite convenient, is in terms of uh, a Hartree part, an exchange part, and uh, yeah, a correlation part, uh, which is written in terms of this uh, lambda, which is the cumulant. In the uh, NO basis, this expression reduces uh, a little bit uh, in terms of uh, some chronic deltas in front for the uh, Hartree and exchange parts. Using this, uh, this splitting up of the, the two RDM, uh, we get uh, basically two contributions to the uh, uh, two body interaction functional. The first one is the uh, non interacting functional, um, and the second part is the uh, correlation functional. So I have to note that the first one uh, with GC for grand canonical, and, and by this is grand canonical, I will come back to later. So if we want to uh, now do things at that finite temperature, we are no longer uh, minimizing an energy. Instead, in the, in the canonical case, we are minimizing this free energy A, and we are minimizing overall uh, N particle density matrices, which are in uh, the correct space, so that the N particle Hilbert space, and what we are minimizing is uh, the first term, so the trace of the Hamiltonian, which is the energy, and the second term, uh, which is uh, minus the entropy, where we find the inverse temperature, one over beta, this thing in front. For the ground canonical case, we instead have the ground potential, which uh, is basically the same, um, except that we add uh, chemical potential here. And what is quite important for the following, the, the minimization is done over the Fox space, so over a, a larger, uh, space. Now, at finite temperature, uh, the one RDM now satisfies for any you know beta smaller than infinity. So for every temperature above zero, uh, that it is uh, not positive semi-definite, but really uh, uh, positive definite. And one minus gamma is uh, positive definite for fermions. In terms of natural orbit occupation numbers, it means they are between zero and one, uh, excluding uh, zero and one. Furthermore, for any uh, a fixed uh, interaction, uh, we have that there is uh, a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, the uh, one uh, electron part of the Hamiltonian and the uh, one body reduced density matrix. And this is something we don't have uh, at zero temperature. So there are ways you can change your uh, one particle Hamiltonian uh, such that it produces the same one RDM and so on. So this was shown uh, by Giesbert and Rugenthaler for the grand canonical case and by Suter and Gisbert for the uh, canonical case. Now, uh, of course, we want to go to finite temperature one RDMFT instead. So going to one RDMFT, we write our, uh, for the canonical case, we write our uh, free energy minimization. Now with, uh, we have doubled our, our problem. So now we have uh, two unknown functionals. So the first part is again, just this uh, one uh, particle energy, which we uh, know directly in terms of the one RDM. Then we have our, uh, part particle interaction, and then we have our uh, entropy. Now, we, we don't know either of these functionals, so yeah, uh, in a way we're in a worse situation. And in the ground canonical case, uh, we have essentially uh, the same case because this chemical potential, it just couples directly to the one or the M, and it's again, the, the entropy and the, um, like the particle particle interaction uh, functional that we don't know. We can then uh, define a constraint search uh, formalism, kind of uh, a la alone, where um, we now minimize overall uh, density matrices. So either uh, in the n-particle Hilbert space or in the Fox space, we minimize the particle-particle uh, interaction energy uh, minus one over beta, and then the entropy. Now, Next jump that I have to make uh, is to go to reference systems at zero temperature. So, whoo. so um, for, for density functional theory, uh, we can, I think, uh, properly conclude that its success uh, really hinged 
on the, the introduction of the, the Cohen Sham reference system. Um, but for one RDMFT, at least at zero temperature, the, the problem is um, yeah, more difficult. The one RDM is not idempotent. So unlike in DFT, we don't we cannot use a, a single slate to determine. We can, however, define a non-interacting Hamiltonian, but it is somewhat uh, pathological. So what we can do is we can use a non-interacting Hamiltonian like this with uh, where P sums over all the natural orbitals. We have some orbital energies epsilon P, but, uh, and then you think, okay, well, we can, we can do something with that. But um, if you look at uh, the spectrum now, so here I'm plotting uh, uh, epsilon P uh, increasing uh, towards the top, um, and I just take some random orbitals, then I have all these orbitals on the top, they correspond to unoccupied orbitals. The orbitals in the middle, uh, which have the uh, same energy as the chemical, they are at the, the Fermi level um, and they have uh, fractional occupations. And at the bottom, we have the fully occupied orbitals. Now, in general, for an uh, interacting system, uh, especially with some uh, nice cusp and with some nice uh, uh, divergences, etc. Um, this uh, partial, partially occupied set of orbitals is uh, essentially uh, all of them, uh, and therefore uh, our ground state is massively degenerate. So this is not very practical. Now, at finite temperature, situations change a little bit. So at finite temperature, the DFT it just kind of vanishes. There is no more uh, single slate determinant. You will always need non-interacting ensemble there. Uh, and for one or the MFT, uh, we can therefore now. Uh, go on uh, to, to an ensemble of uh, slated determinants in the following way. So we had this, uh, this uh, interaction free energy. Uh, what we simply do is we uh, stripe out the uh, interaction part of it, and then we are only left with the entropy, which is a little bit odd. So in, in DFT, uh, th this isn't the case uh, because one would still have the kinetic energy here, but in one or DMFT, we are only left with, with the entropy. So once we do this, uh, we have a minimization over all density matrices of uh, minus one over beta of the entropy. Um, but we can just pull this one over beta outside. And then we see that what we're actually doing here is we're, we're maximizing the entropy completely independent of the uh, temperature. So in the end, we end up with a non-interacting entropy, uh, S0, which also only uh, depends on the natural orbital occupation numbers, which is independent of temperature. And yeah, maybe even more importantly, the, uh, the minimizer, the non-interacting ensemble is also independent of temperature. The corresponding, uh, uh, corresponding Hamiltonian, so non-interacting Hamiltonian uh, has orbital energies which do depend on, on temperature um, and they depend on the natural orbital occupation numbers in this case, but they depend on the, uh, the uh, temperature in a rather trivial way. So if I want to have the uh, orbital energies at uh, beta, but I only have them at beta prime. All I have to do is multiply by beta prime and divide by beta. Now, we now have this uh, non-interaction uh, ensemble. And what we can uh, do is we can take the uh, expectation value of this non-interacting ensemble. So this should be a zero here uh, with this uh, two particle uh, uh, operator. And this gives us our zero of order approximation to the uh, particle, particle interaction. So then we can define a non-interacting free energy approximation, this A0, which is uh, simply combining these two. So combining the uh, non-interacting entropy uh, with the uh, approximation to the uh, uh, two-body interaction. So then of course, we do the usual trick. We say, okay, um, we use this as an approximation and the rest we just say is some, some functional we need to approximate some correlation free energy which is the difference between the proper interacting uh, free energy minus the non-interacting free energy. Um, so what's kind of important here to note is that although both in the canonical and ground canonical case uh, we need to only approximate the free energy uh, the functional in both cases is not the same so the constraint search is, is over a different Hilbert space. This is, uh, can be a large effect as well. So in the ground canonical ensemble, all expressions for the non-interacting ensemble are, are well known. Um, they're just our usual Fermi-Dirac expressions, et cetera, et cetera. So our uh, entropy uh, is, is just this entropy of the 
defined in terms of the natural orbital occupation numbers, here uh, the particle and here the whole uh, entropy. Um, the occupation numbers are just our Fermi Dirac or Bose uh, Einstein um, uh, expressions. Um, we can invert those easily to get the orbital energies in terms of the natural orbital occupation numbers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we have this, and, and this is why I call this W0GC. If we uh, use the grand canonical ensemble as an approximation um, for the 2RDM, then uh, we get this uh, approximation uh, in terms of the natural orbital occupation numbers. Yeah. So now we go to the, 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 the interesting part, the, the canonical non-interacting reference. So in the canonical ensemble, things are, are more difficult. We don't have so many uh, closed form solutions, but uh, some me methods have been developed for evaluating expectation values of uh, canonical ensembles, both for bosons and fermions. Uh, so this recent work of uh, Bargatti uh, and co-workers is uh, probably most uh, influential uh, to this work. Um, and, and, but they rely on some expressions um, which were derived by Bormann and Franke. So the key concept um, in this work of Bargatti is uh, so-called auxiliary partition functions. So what we can do uh, is introduce a partition function with this cup P notation which means that we add another orbital to our system with the same energy as P. Then we can write, for example, the expectation value of the, uh, 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 of the, the, the occupation uh, numbers um, in terms of this uh, uh, auxiliary partition function. For fermions, it, it works the, the other way around. We have this uh, slash P, um, we remove, uh, where we remove the orbital P from the partition function and then calculate, uh, calculate. Now, of course, we still need to actually compute this partition function and then these uh, auxiliary partition functions. However, this bormann franke they, they, they uh, obtained this uh, equation for the uh, m particle partition function for, for both, both bosons and fermions. And you can find, so the m particle partition function in terms of the m minus one, m minus two, et cetera, uh, partition functions. So you can um, recursively uh, build this up. Once you have those uh, partition functions, oh wait, yeah. So so one term you need here in the CK is a, that's where the uh, the orbital energies come in. So we have here this uh, sum over P, and the importance is here that the CK has this uh, factor K here in the exponent. Once you have these uh, partition functions, um, it's quite easy to obtain these auxiliary partition functions. Um, for uh, all of these orbitals uh, in terms of, again, the orbital uh, energies and the uh, partition functions. So what is uh, a bit unfortunate here uh, compared to the ground canonical case is that there's no clear way to invert the relation between these orbital energies and the occupation uh, numbers. So due to the results of uh, Sutra and Giesbert's, we know that there is this one-to-one -one correspondence. So we know that um, uh, there are um, orbital energies corresponding to the uh, occupation numbers uh, always, and that there is only you know one set, uh, but we still need to find it somehow. This is where some uh, knowledge of uh, entropically regularized optimal transport, I should have put that in the title as well, um, comes in. So uh, you have this so-called Singhorn algorithm in uh, optimal transport, which is actually extremely simple as a way to solve these types of problems where you have so-called, uh, you're minimizing the cost with fixed marginals and so on. So the Sinkhorn algorithm in this case uh, looks a bit like this. So uh, we want to every, at every step update uh, our uh, orbital energies until uh, we are getting uh, the correct natural orbital occupation numbers. And so what we do is we update it in, with this term in terms of the uh, occupation number. And then we have uh, two terms in terms of uh, partition functions. Basically, it's just the uh, equation from the previous slide uh, inverted. Now that uh, turns out to not work so well. Uh, so there, uh, the first part of the title of the talk comes in, so-called bosonic and fermionic uh, Silgorm algorithms. Uh, so we can use uh, some relations uh, of these partition functions in terms of auxiliary partition functions to uh, rewrite uh, our expressions for the for the uh, expectation values, and then uh, we get a slightly different update equation, but it's uh, different in an important way. 
So now the first term is exactly equal to uh, what would be the orbital energies in the ground canonical approximation. And the other two terms are now both in terms of the auxiliary partition function. So this uh, last term here is uh, different. So how do we do this in practice? So here, this is kind of a schematic of, of how the algorithm works. So you start with your natural orbital occupation numbers, you pick some temperature, you pick uh, some convergence criteria, maximum iterations, et cetera. Then you start from this ground canonical gas. That's, that's a nice uh, start. Uh, from this gas of the orbital energies, you compute uh, free energies. So in the previous slides, I was talking about partition functions, but for numerical stability, uh, one wants to work with uh, free energies instead. So you compute uh, these free energies, all of those that we need for the, for the update, et cetera. We then compute the natural orbital occupation numbers with this orbital energies. And if they are good enough, then we are done. Uh, if not, then uh, we do this update on the uh, orbital energies. Uh, how does this scale? Well, in terms of compute, uh, scales quite favorably, uh, quadratic in a number of orbitals. In terms of memory, it scales linear in a number of orbitals. So for the remainder of the talk, uh, beta will always be one. So uh, as I discussed, it doesn't really matter for the ensemble what temperature we pick. Uh, you might imagine that it influences the uh, performance of the algorithm or so on, but it makes absolutely no, uh, no difference. Then to uh, implementation. So implementation was done in Python with JAX. Uh, so JAX uh, is a, a package from Google that I'm a little bit in love with because I managed to do all this with only 263 lines of code, do all these inversions and, and compute all these partition functions, et cetera. And the nice thing about JAX is that, of course, normally Python is slow, but JAX uh, allows for just-in-time compilation and then it's lightning fast. Uh, you can, with a single um, command, you can uh, factorize your expression. So if you want to just parallelize over all orbitals, this is just one line. And uh, this part I'm not, uh, I'm not using uh, now, but JAX also allows for both forward and reverse mode automatic differentiation, um, which is just a very nice thing to have. And also, yeah, the code works without modification on CPU, GPU, and, and TPU if you want. So then uh, once you've, you have a, an implementation, you need to test it somehow. So uh, basically I uh, have been kind of first simulating these natural orbital uh, distributions by which I mean, I just kind of made them up. Um, and then, yeah, also obtain some from uh, PyCF calculations with, for example, CCSD. Now, uh, I lied a little bit uh, to you about the algorithm because that what I showed was actually for bosons. So for fermions, um, there is a very nasty uh, numerical instability, uh, even if you're working with the uh, free energies. And basically the problem is you need, you need to compute the logarithm um, of this alternating sum of uh, free energies. And what you have a lot is that uh, two of these terms uh, decide to exactly cancel and you run into uh, numerical problems. So instead for fermions, uh, everything is implemented in terms of uh, partition function ratio. So the ratio between the M particle uh, partition function over the M minus one particle partition function. And then also uh, the same operation uh, one applies to this uh, uh, these, this coefficient CM, you need to compute the, the partition function. So you use these ratios of partition functions. Then uh, one can compute uh, again in an iterative manner, these uh, partition function ratios by this uh, yeah, uh, recurring um, products in terms of the lower order partition function ratios and these uh, functions are. Uh, I think that probably on this project, 95% of my time uh, was spent on just uh, dealing with fermions and the numerical instability, which is why uh, I'm angry at them. Okay, some results. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, I'm doing iterations of this, this Sinkhorn algorithm, and I'm showing the error in the 1RDM on the logarithmic scale, and the error is just the uh, sum of the absolute difference um, in the uh, natural orbital occupation numbers we want, minus the, the ones we have at iteration i. Now, in this case, I had 20 bosons in, in 10 orbitals, and I just made up some distribution. So I have one orbital, which is very heavily occupied, 16. And in the others, they are all uh, below one decaying like this. Now, the Sinkhorn al algorithm, uh, as I alluded to already, uh, unfortunately doesn't converge. Or actually, I think it, it probably still 
converges uh, exponentially, uh, except a very, very, very uh, small exponent. However, the, the bosonic sinkhorn, it, it reaches very uh, small errors in uh, less than uh, 10 iterations. Now, of course, 20 bosons in 10 orbitals, maybe not so much. So this plot is for 1,000 <laughs> bosons in uh, 10,000 orbitals. Um, and here, sinkhorn actually does a little better, but uh, yeah, it's a bit lucky here. Um, so uh, yeah, it also works for, for larger numbers. Um, and this takes like a few seconds on just your CPU. So you don't even need all this GPU, TPU fanciness. It, it's all uh, very, very fast. Thanks to Jax. Now for fermions here, I have five fermions in, in 13 orbitals. And then, yeah, I, I made five orbitals uh, quite strongly occupied. And then the rest are uh, weakly occupied. And I again tested the synchorn and now the fermionic synchorn. Now, again, the synchorn doesn't converge. The fermionic synchorn does, but it takes quite a lot more iterations than for the, the bosonic case, which uh, is something I see quite systematically. And uh, something which is a bit uh, unfortunate is that at the first iterations, uh, the fermionic synchron actually uh, may worsen it a bit and then only uh, overtake the synchron after say 20 uh, iterations. Um, also uh, in some more uh, severe cases, it may be that the fermionic synchron runs into severe numerical issues uh, right at the start and then uh, one, uh, yeah, you're, you're basically stuck. So um, what I've kind of found as a solution is that you just do 10 iterations of the synchron and then you halt start with the fermionic synchron and then um, things work much better. So this is an example of that. So this is uh, the one on the M uh, or the natural orbital occupation numbers of um, H2O uh, obtained from C, uh, CCSD in a CCPVQZ basis. And I have here the natural orbital occupation numbers and I have quite a lot of orbitals, but only you know small part, uh, which is actually uh, highly occupied. And okay, synchron again uh, goes nowhere. Fermionic synchron here at 10, 10 iterations, it, um, it, it's hot started from the synchron and then immediately jumps down and uh, goes down to, into a quite uh, low region. But yeah, uh, we do uh, see some uh, numerical issues here at the bottom, but in this case, it's not so bad because already the error in the one RDM is uh, quite small. However, still there are particular cases uh, in which it, it, you run into numerical issues. And unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure about why that happens. Now, one uh, note that's maybe interesting is, so we have these orbital energies now, and, and uh, yeah, how are they related to the grand canonical? Are they very different? So here I've plotted again for the, for the uh, water at some uh, equilibrium geometry, uh, the natural orbital occupation number versus uh, the orbital energy here, uh, natural orbital occupation number on the logarithmic axis. And here, you don't see it here on the left, but uh, so these strongly occupied orbitals, the orbital energies, uh, they overlap uh, exactly. Uh, but yeah, then these weakly occupied orbitals, they are all kind of shifted by a constant. So you can basically choose <laughs> by playing with the constant in these orbital energies, whether or not you want the, str the strongly or weakly occupied uh, um, orbitals. This is even clearer if you plot the orbital energies in the ground canonical versus the canonical, and you see that, okay, now these are directly on the uh, diagonal, and these are all on one line uh, of the diagonal. So now uh, for the, the interesting question, we would like to also have this uh, uh, approximation to the, the uh, two-particle interaction uh, for the canonical ensemble. Um, but, but to do this, we now need these uh, two-particle correlations. and in, in, Unlike in the, uh, canonical, uh, the grand canonical case, it's no longer a, a product of just NP and NQ. Um, this does make some things a bit unfortunate uh, because you do need to do an AO to NO transform here, which is uh, not ideal for computational efficiency. So can we get expressions for this, these uh, expectation values, these two body expectation values? Yes, so there's a very uh, cute, uh, simple expression for uh, non-degenerate orbitals, and, and we must also have P not equal to Q, uh, in terms of just these uh, orbital energies and the occupation numbers. Now, it's clear, however, that uh, if the orbitals are degenerate, and so they have the same energies and the same occupation numbers, then this uh, expression uh, diverges. So we also want the case where P equal to Q, at least for, for bosons, and in that case, 
um, we need this uh, to do this sum, which is similar to what we needed to do for these auxiliary partition functions. And for fermions, for once they are well behaved. For the generated orbitals, again, we get a sum very similar to what we get for the auxiliary partition functions. Um, and yeah, in this way, you can get all of them. So now in, in the next few slides, I will be kind of talking about zero temperature theory. So it's, it's maybe important to emphasize um, why we want to do this. Why, why does the choice of ensemble matter at zero temperature? I mean, we are not really uh, dealing with the, temperature, with, with the actual uh, statistics anymore. So in 1RDMFT, this reference ensemble, this non-interacting reference ensemble is independent of temperature. And when we then take uh, the uh, zero temperature limit of our free energy functional to obtain our energy functional, we get uh, our usual components. So the, uh, the one particle uh, terms, the uh, approximation uh, to the interaction and then the correlation uh, correction where this correlation correction can be seen as a limit of the temperature to zero of this correlation free energy. And what's now crucial is that uh, you get different W zero of gamma uh, from different two RDMs, which are different for the different ensembles. So uh, you can, in your zero temperature case, you can uh, pick whatever uh, ensemble you want for this W zero. Now it is true, that for the grand canonical case, this is a bit easier because we have that expression very easily. For the canonical case, we need this bosonic or fermionic single. So the question is then, is there an advantage to the canonical uh, W0? Is, is all this effort worth it? Well, one, one good sign is that if we have this uh, grand canonical approximation to the 2RDM, it does not trace to the correct 1RDM and not, also not to the correct particle number. However, for the, the canonical approximation, which I showed before, uh, we do actually get that it traces to the correct uh, one body reduced density matrix, just like the, the exact 2RDM. Then another <laughs> important uh, issue here is that our non-interacting density matrix will in general break uh, spin symmetries almost always. So what, because yeah, uh, I mean, it will break as many symmetries as possible because uh, this typically allows it to, to maximize its entropy more. So for example, the expectation value of S squared in general does not match for the non-interacting ensemble and for the, the true ensemble. So what we can do is we can at least uh, somewhat alleviate this by restricting our, our Hilbert space. So we already have those options, the canonical, uh, the uh, ground canonical, uh, but what we can add is that we, for example, only take slate determinants such that uh, th they have a certain they are eigenstates uh, uh, of the uh, spin projection operator with a particular value. And this is a subset of the uh, n particle Hilbert space. We can also do the same for S squared, but only now here uh, we have configuration state functions, and this is then a subset of S set. So here, uh, what I did was run calculations for CISD, or for uh, CISD, so that's exact for, for a two electron system like. Uh, um, uh, like H2, and I uh, used auxi C PVQC basis. And here I've plotted this non interacting entropy, so it should be a zero here, uh, as a function of the uh, interatomic distance. So all of these curves uh, look really alike. So I've, I've plotted it for all these different um, wave function uh, space, for all these different Hilbert spaces. And um, what we see is it's a fairly simple pattern. So uh, the one for the Fox space is the largest, then comes the n-particle Hilbert space, then comes S set, and then comes uh, S. Um, so yeah, we see in this direction, uh, really just this restriction of variational freedom. So we are trying to maximize this entropy and the, the Fox space is, has the most uh, variational freedom. Well, uh, S, so restricting S squared as well as the least. Now, here comes a bit of a, a maybe slightly too chaotic plot, uh, but here I'm plotting the total energy where I've used the uh, W0 from uh, different approximations. So here this golden color is the, the exact curve that we all know so very, very well. Um, I've added restricted Hartree Fock and unrestricted Hartree Fock. So here unrestricted Hartree Fock and here the uh, restricted Hartree Fock. And then um, these four uh, choices of uh, uh, Hilbert space um, where 
the 1RDM was used uh, from the exact calculation. So here on top, we have the, the ground canonical case, so the Fox space case. Uh, then uh, comes this um, case where we have S squared fixed, um, then uh, S set fixed. And then here, interestingly, uh, below restricted hardware, I'm not sure exactly how it does that. Um, we have the uh, canonical case where we uh, allow for the full and particle Hilbert space. Now, of course, to get something quantitative, we need to add clearly uh, a correlation functional to this. Uh, but what I find a very interesting question, which I haven't answered yet, is what happens when you uh, uh, self-consistently optimize it. So what's kind of interesting about this uh, n-particle Hilbert space case is that the 1RDM doesn't break the spin symmetry. Uh, the the uh, spin up, spin down orbitals have same occupation numbers. They are the same orbitals. Yet it can be below the restricted Hartree fog. And that is something I didn't really expect. So I, I checked it a lot. Um, but somehow it manages to mix in enough uh, triplets in the 2RDM to uh, go below restricted Hartree fog despite the fact that the 1RDM doesn't show any signs of uh, um, spin symmetry breaking. Now for the, the, the Fox space case, or so for the ground canonical case, we actually have a proof by, by LEAP that uh, if we now self-consistently optimize it, we just go uh, to either the restricted or the unrestricted Hartree fog dep depending on whether or not we restrict our 1RDM to have the correct symmetry. And then, yeah, for, for the, the M particle uh, Hilbert space, uh, I, uh, I don't uh, really know. I don't really know for, for S set and I don't really know for S. Well, for S, um, yeah, I, I would find it difficult to believe that it would go below uh, unrestricted Hartree Fock, but who knows? So, uh, yeah, what is left for future work? Uh, plenty. Um, as of yet, only done evaluation on exact 1RDMs at uh, zero temperature. Um, yeah, really uh, for practical use, stability for fermions still needs to be improved uh, somehow, even though I've spent plenty of time on it. Um, it's important, yeah, one of the next steps really is, is to do self-consistent optimization. And this can be done by integrating with uh, PyCF or the, the recent uh, PyCF variant that was uh, translated to JAX, PyCF AD for automatic differentiation. One thing uh, for self-consistent optimization is that you don't really want to distinguish this degenerate, non-degenerate case, uh, but you can calculate uh, these, uh, yeah, these uh, correlations uh, also uh, using uh, auxiliary, different auxiliary partition functions here for the n minus two system where you uh, either add an orbital p and an orbital q or uh, you move p and q. Then for self-consistent optimization, we also need uh, derivatives of this uh, functional W0, uh, which we need to do via uh, derivative of the uh, orbital energies with respect to the occupation numbers. And that we can get either from automatic differentiation of the Sinkhorn algorithm or using the uh, implicit function theorem. Now, of course, kind of the, the important thing is the, the missing correlation functional, uh, which I don't really have that much of a clue of. Um, however, um, I have already for quite a while, even before this project in preparation, uh, a reference system of kind of similar to this that takes into account part of the interaction and actually captures uh, most of the static correlation. Um, and yeah, that may uh, reduce the size of this correlation functional uh, to make, make it easier to uh, approximate. So to conclude, um, so finite temperature one are the MFT in the canonical ensemble was studied numerically for the first time. Uh, canonical uh, non-interacting reference system was uh, introduced um, for using this reference system, bosonic and fermionic synchron algorithms were derived and implemented in the BF synchron package. The algorithms were shown to be efficient and perform well for both uh, simulated and ground state 1RDMs, although yeah, the fermionic case still could be better. Um, and the study of the corresponding uh, approximation to this uh, W0, so this non-interacting approximation to the uh, uh, two-particle interaction functional revealed uh, quite interesting behavior also with respect to the ground canonical, especially this uh, n-particle Hilbert space uh, case uh, I found quite uh, interesting. Uh, so with that, I have come to the end of my talk. So I want to uh, thank uh, some of my co-workers, especially uh, uh, Klaus and Paula for, for a lot of uh, insightful discussions and uh, careful readings of the manuscript, helpful comments about all of this. 
um, yeah, the usual financial support and your uh, the references. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk, for this uh, for the nice talk. Um, so now it's time for uh, for questions. So if you have a question, uh, you can virtually raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, maybe I start. I don't see a question yet. So. Um, yeah, it was not clear to me when you are at zero temperature and when you use finite temperature. So sometimes you mentioned that all the results are for zero temperature, but then you say beta is equal to one. So this means that there is a temperature, right? So it's which results were, would you go I, through the results again and show which, which were obtained for zero temperature and where there is a finite temperature? So the uh, kind of the point is the following. So, um, no, let's go for so, yeah. So first, like these these orbital energies, right? They they depend on on a particular choice of beta, and in particular, if you go to zero temperature, they all just go to zero. So th that th they are are dependent on temperature uh, and not just on the, the one RDM. So that's um, e Let me think which is the best way to show this. So when you you do this this uh, kind of optimization here uh, for this these orbital energies, you do have this effect of the beta, but it's only an, an overall uh, scaling, let's say. Um, and it's it's otherwise um, um, inconsequential. But the uh, kind of important part is that when I then show these results for um, H2, for example, Uh, this entropy um, as zero, this is uh, temperature independent uh, by itself. Um, but yeah, of course, when you put it in your free energy, you put the minus one over beta in front. Um, then for this total energy, uh, so here I took you know, the, the, the ground state energy expression, uh, but I used this, this uh, canonical approximation to the uh, two particle interaction. And that is uh, also temperature independent. So these you can use at zero temperature fine. It's just that the, the orbital energies, yeah, they, that, that's kind of this uh, pathology of, uh, of one RDMFT in a way, uh, is that if you use this non-interacting approximation uh, and you go to zero temperature, then they all have to become degenerate. Um, yeah, so that's basically the split in the results depending on temperature or not. So these results here are for zero temperature? Yes. Okay, but so it's to circumvent the problems of uh, ordinary a one R DMFT. Right. So uh, ordinary one R DMFT, uh, you would start from this F approximation, right, from the grand canonical approximation. And um, what you see here is that if you uh, instead use this canonical approximation, you are already much lower, and so your correlation energy has to do less work to give you the correct um, energy. Okay, I wouldn't say that you say that the standard one RDMFT is the one in the grand canonical ensemble. Yeah, so so there is this. Uh, okay, you can also so so there is the original kind of this derivation by uh, Kuzelnicki. So he doesn't come there via the grand canonical ensemble. So in that sense, it was a bit provocative, maybe. But this starting approximation where you have this Hartree and exchange terms. Um, if you want to say that comes from an ensemble, then that's the ground canonical ensemble. Then uh, after that, you can uh, add uh, correlation. And then, of course, you get a different result than this. But this is kind of more uh, showing what is the base of the functional. So what's always kind of the, the idea is, is that if you have to approximate something, then you want to approximate, uh, you, want, you want to make it as small as possible. So if you can reduce here, so this correlation energy here uh, has to be uh, of much larger uh, uh, magnitude for uh, this ground canonical expression than for this canonical expression. Okay. Um, 
may I may, may I just Take maybe to continue on this just to understand so just to understand uh, what you are doing so um I mean you are using the finite temperature approach uh to use a non-interacting system that otherwise you would not uh, use at t equal zero right no because yeah it, it, in the end it, exactly. it just, just comes from from maximizing entropy exactly and, and, so, so oh. Yeah, so the idea is to use this ensemble, the, the temperature that you want, and then at the end, you take the limit of T, which goes to zero. Right. Right. But, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, and then when you work in the, at the final temperature, so which, uh, so maybe it's this part that I, I also missed. So which approximation do you use for your uh, uh, correlation part because you are saying that the correlation part depends on the kind of assemble that you use, can canonical, canonical, but a certain point you have to approximate this part of the correlation. No? Yeah, so, so maybe, I, I, maybe I missed that. No, so I haven't actually discussed that um, because uh, I haven't started anything uh, related to making approximations to the, the correlation part itself. Um, so I think that from this non-interacting uh, reference system. So, so this non-interacting ah, reference system is, is okay. completely independent of temperature, right? So we, we um, this, 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 uh, yeah. th there isn't, there is not, there's no arbitrary parameter I'm hiding from you here. It's not this, this beta, if I had taken beta equal 1000, or I had taken beta equal 10 to the minus three, these curves would have all looked the same. That's, that's completely inconsequential. Um, yeah. So this is maybe the, the part that, uh, that is the most confusing is that I'm, I'm basically saying two things uh, at once. I am saying you can uh, do canonical one RDMFT uh, at finite temperature uh, in this way. So if you have your particular physical scenario requires that you do that, now you can do one RDMFT with that. And the second is that really what I personally mostly want to do is <laughs> electrons at zero temperature is that this, uh, you can still use this reference ensemble at zero temperature, that that's fine, um, and and maybe that's a bit better starting point uh, than using uh, the standard NP times NQ. I think that's yeah. Okay, uh, I'll think about it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there uh, other questions? Can I? Yes, Are go ahead, Claudio. Yeah. Um, hi. Very nice. I, I would just perhaps a very naive question. I mean, if I understood correctly, the talk basically all the examples that you have provided are uh, for finite systems. Uh, do you envisage any problems? And if you want to really treat a, a real solid, so to speak. Well, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, it would certainly uh, make it rather difficult to do this uh, Sinkhorn algorithm because mm -hmm. uh, you would have to somehow uh, take into account um, this uh, continuous distribution. Mm -hmm. um, no, honestly, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe somebody else has, an, has a suggestion. Um, Couldn't you discretize in case space? Would it make sense? Yes. Right, so so one are the MFT, of course, for for solids is something people are, have looked at quite a bit. So you could discretize in case space certainly, but yeah, uh, I'm I'm a little bit worried about how you would then um, yeah apply the Sinkhorn algorithm, but would become very large presumably because you have to keep all the variables in one shot at the same time. Yeah. So what is it? So 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 the the the, the very uh, fortunate uh, thing at least. Uh, for, for bosons, you can very clearly see it is that it's basically always, it always finishes in, in, in 10 ish iterations. And you can do mm. it uh, with as many particles and orbitals as you want because it's quadratic mm. in, in compute and linear in memory. So um, if, if one would be able to do that also for fermions, then that would help a lot. But that would also, sorry if I interrupt you, just for my understanding, but that would perhaps it is also for, fair, for bosons what's helping you that you collapse on the lowest state, perhaps. The yeah, so mm -hmm. the convergence, right? So, so yeah, so 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 I, I've given some thought about what, where exactly uh, is the problem uh, here, and 
with bosons, um, also when I pick, uh, uh, for bosons, uh, you can pick a distribution uh, like fermions and just mm -hmm. run it. That's right. um, and then still it works much better. Um, okay. Think, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, so, so I think the main um, thing just with the fermions is that even though I have done, tried to do as much this trickery to get uh, rid of the, uh, oh God, where did I put it? Here. So uh, I've tried to get rid of this as much as possible, but still here I have this uh, one minus R2 mm -hmm. and then times one minus R. And, and it's really this, uh, this, so what you can have is that you have one iterate so so when you you do this step by step you get one minus something very close to one and then mm -hmm. this becomes a very small number and then mm -hmm. the next one is one uh, it's very close to one so it's that the next one is again very close to zero and you get this kind of uh, alternating wobble um and I, I think that's the the the, the main issue um mm -hmm. so you can also already kind of um, understand why that must be the case um, from from this uh, expression of the grand canonical case. So for uh, bosons, you have here NP over one plus NP, and that's fine. Uh, NP is some number larger than zero, etc. Now for uh, for fermions, if you have NP, you have NP over uh, one minus NP, um, mm -hmm. and then for NP very close to one, for example, mm -hmm. um, you, you yeah. get into issues. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, and that then needs to be kind of canceled by this, these, these uh, two other uh, uh, functionals. It's, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I may have underestimated how tricky uh, fermions are in that sense. Uh, okay, but thank you, thanks. Okay, time for maybe a last question. Um, I just have a quick question just to be sure I understood. So you said that the the results uh, for the non-interacting uh, system are independent of beta, um, but I guess the, the result would be scaled, right, or not? Uh, that depends on which. So the, the the orbital energies are scaled, yes, via this expression that I yeah yeah okay I had somewhere around I don't know here. Uh, I think already with the grand canonical I mentioned. Yeah, so this yeah. Uh, expression. Uh, so here, these, uh, these orbital energies, they, they have the scaling, but the uh, non-interacting entropy itself uh, is independent. Uh, but then, yeah, if, if you were actually working at finite temperature, right, then you put this minus one over beta, and that's how you get the, the temperature dependence in there in the finite temperature case. Um, and then this um, this non-interacting approximation uh, to to the to particle interaction um, again. So this because in this minimization you can pull this one over beta out. So you're just maximizing entropy independent of of temperature. Um, this this is completely independent of uh, temperature, and therefore this quantity is also independent of temperature. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's it's a bit counterintuitive, also because in the DFT case, this is not not true. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so it's three o'clock, so it's a good time to to stop. So thanks again, Dirk, for this nice talk, and thanks for all of, all of you for joining.